Good day, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you about Taylor neck fractures. Let's start with the epidemiology of these injuries. Taylor neck fractures are the most common tarsal bone fracture after calcaneal fractures. They comprise between 0.1 and 0.8% of all fractures that are seen. Up to 25% of these injuries are open. And one needs to be careful about associated non-contiguous or systemic trauma, which may delay the diagnosis and the treatment of these injuries. The anatomy of the talus is odd. The overall osteology comprises a head, neck, and body. And on the undersurface of the talus, there are three facets which make up the subtalar joint, the posterior facet, the middle facet, and the anterior facet. More than 60% of the surface area articulates with other bones. The talus has no tendon or muscle attachments. And it has been said that the second hardest bone of the body is the talus, following only the petrosal bone of the skull. The mechanism of the Taylor neck fracture is a hyperdorsiflexion mechanism of the ankle with concomitant axial load applied. This is usually seen with motor vehicle accidents or falls from height. Historically, the Taylor neck fracture has been called the aviator's astralagus. This was coined by Anderson in 1919 in a report of a series of 18 fractures in pilots during World War I. These injuries were caused by a hyperdorsiflexion force to the foot by the rudder bar of the aircraft on belly landings. One of the common questions that I get from trainees is where does the neck begin and the body end? And this differentiation is important in determining whether patients have either Taylor neck fracture or a Taylor body fracture. Fractures anterior to the lateral process are Taylor neck fractures. So in this example, although there is comminution present, all fracture lines are anterior to the lateral process of the talus, and therefore this is a true Taylor neck fracture. Fractures posterior to the lateral process are Taylor body fractures. Complications associated with Taylor neck fractures are non-union, which occur in about 4% of injuries, osteonecrosis, which can occur in up to 20% of injuries, and malunion, which occurs 100% of the time if the Taylor neck fracture is not reduced and fixated properly. The Taylor blood supply is crucial to understanding the pathology and healing of many Taylor pathologies. This is nowhere more true than with Taylor neck fractures. In this cartoon, the talus is viewed from the medial side, and you can see that there are two arteries supplying the anterior portion and part of the posterior portion of the talus. The first is the dorsalis pedis artery, and the second is the posterior tibial artery. The dorsalis pedis artery gives rise to the lateral tarsal artery, which wraps around the inferolateral lateral portion of the Taylor neck, as well as some retinacular vessels that supply the dorsal portion of the talus. The posterior tibial artery gives rise to posterior tubercle branches, 
as well as deltoid branches and the artery of the tarsal canal, which wraps around the medial aspect of the neck. And anastomosis with the lateral tarsal artery to form the inferior portion of the retinacular vessels of the talus. The lateral view shows the dorsalis pedis artery as well as the perforating perineal artery and the there is a lateral tarsal artery that branches between these two and again forms that artery that reflects along the lateral neck of the talus and anastomosis with the blood supply from the medial side to form the inferior retinacular vessels. This artery coming from the lateral side is called the artery of the tarsal sinus. Finally, we'll look at the inferior view of the talus and here you can see that artery of the tarsal sinus as well as the artery of the tarsal canal joining to form that inferior portion of the anastomotic ring. Osteonecrosis of the talus can be a very serious complication associated with Taylor neck fractures and this has been found to occur in up to 20 percent of Taylor neck fractures. This rate goes up to 50% with large amounts of comminution or in open injuries. The good news is that many cases of osteonecrosis of the talus are asymptomatic. And 30% of those with AVN go on to collapse. The treatment of osteonecrosis of the talus was formally suggested as strict non-weight bearing for 36 months. As you can imagine, this is a very difficult treatment regimen to comply with. Now, most people prescribe weight bearing as tolerated in a patellar tendon bearing cast. Weight bearing on an acrotic talus poses no injury risk for collapse as shown by Penny. Another sometimes confusing term is the Hawkins sign. What you need to know is that the Hawkins sign is a good thing. It occurs about six weeks after open reduction in internal fixation of the talus. And it indicates that the blood flow to the Taylor body is good. Occasionally, the Hawkins sign will only be seen medially. And the pathoetiology or the physiology behind the Hawkins sign is one of contrast. There is disuse osteoporosis under the subchondral bone of the dome, and resorption of this requires blood flow. This resorption indicates resumption of blood flow. Malunion of the talus is the most common preventable complication. It occurs in up to 32% of all Taylor neck fractures. Neck fractures commonly have medial comminution and this predisposes to fixation of the Taylor neck fracture in varus. Varus malunion leads to subtalar malalignment and subtalar malalignment subsequently leads to post-traumatic arthritis. Treatment of Taylor malunion, Taylor neck malunion, is an osteotomy, a subtalar fusion, tibio-talocalcaneal fusion. Imaging of Taylor neck fractures should start out with three views of the ankle. A canale view can also be obtained, which is a direct AP of the Taylor neck. CT with reconstructions help to judge impaction, plan the approach, and also hardware placement. 
The hawkins Canali classification is frequently used to help classify and describe the severity of Taylor neck fracture injuries. Hawkins 1 injuries are non-displaced or minimally displaced Taylor neck fractures. Hawkins 2 injuries are displaced and also have subtalar dislocation associated with them. Hawkins 3 fractures are displaced with subtalar and tibiotalar dislocation. And type 4 injuries are displaced with pantalar dislocation. That is to say, tibiotalar, subtalar, and talonavicular. This injury here demonstrates a Taylor neck fracture that is displaced with displacement at the subtalar joint as well as the tibiotalar joint, but maintenance of the talonavicular articulation. Therefore, this represents a Hawkins 3 injury. This partial extrusion of the talus although it's unclear whether there is an associated Taylor neck fracture with it, would represent a Hawkins 4 if there is indeed a neck fracture associated with it. One of the uses of the Hawkins Canale classification is as a predictor of AVN. As you can see, as one progresses from class 1 all the way to class 4, the risk of AVN goes up significantly with less than 10% of class 1 fractures going on to have AVN, with less than 40% of fractures with class 2 injuries, and then jumping up to greater than 90% of injuries with AVN in class 3 and with class 4 100% of injuries. One of the things that has changed markedly since my training in orthopedic traumatology was the urgency needed for operating on Taylor neck fractures. Not too many years ago, a Taylor neck fracture was considered an orthopedic emergency and needed to be taken to the OR for reduction and fixation as soon as possible. So fractures like this would be taken in the middle of the night to undergo reduction and fixation. This has changed and it has been found that fractures that have reasonable reduction can be left overnight to be operated on by the light of day when proper personnel, equipment, and time is available to tend to them. The paper by Valier et al. demonstrated that the average time to fixation was 3.7 days in their retrospective study. They found no correlation between delay and the development of osteonecrosis in mildly to non-displaced Taylor neck fractures. An important point in analyzing this data is that delayed ORAF does not equal urgent closed fracture reduction. To illustrate this, I would show you this fracture. This is not mildly to non-displaced, and this one does require some sort of urgent reduction in order to allow blood flow to be maintained and for there to be a 
reasonable delay in performing definitive ORIF. So an important point is that you need to reduce all fractures that are more than minimally displaced to get them into a safe zone where definitive fixation can then be delayed. Another question that still is discussed in the 21st century is do all fractures need surgery? And when you look historically, it's been said that Hawkins 1 fractures can be treated closed as long as the reduction is radiographically monitored. In contrast, Hansen in skeletal trauma said all fractures benefit from compression and fixation to aid in the restoration of blood supply. And although I think both of these statements are correct, I'd like to hold this thought and return to it when we review one of the pearls that I'm going to give you, specifically pearl number three later in this talk. Now, I wanted to present to you a one-slide outline of how I go about performing ORIF of Taylor neck fractures. Obviously, there's a lot of detail in here that's not covered, but this does provide a good framework for you to work off of and build your own technique. First thing is to perform a reduction of any dislocation to prevent skin necrosis or vascular compromise. And we covered that a couple slides ago in talking about when you can delay definitive ORIF of these injuries. The next thing is to obtain a CT to judge the comminution and alignment and details of the injury. In the operating room, I use a medial and lateral or ollier incision, and I base my reduction off of the lateral neck. And this is because of the medial comminution that is not infrequently present. And this has to do or is due to the different type of bone present on the lateral side of the neck versus the medial side. The medial side has a very thin cortex and a lot of cancellous bone, whereas the lateral side of the Taylor neck has a very nice cortical ridge that is somewhat triangular in shape and is infrequently comminuted in these injuries. And for this reason, I base my reduction off the lateral neck if there is any question of comminution or compaction of the medial side. I will use plates, screws, or a combination of both, and I will bone graft the medial side if needed. Here's an example of a fracture I put together with only screws, and these are all going from anterior to posterior. Here I used a combination of a lag screw with some other screws in the head region because of a head splitting fracture, and then I buttressed this with a mini blade plate on the lateral side of the talus. Instability can be associated with these fractures and the ankle or subtalar joint instability can persist after you perform your ORIF. If this is the case, I will look to use a TTC wire which goes from the calcaneus into the talus and the tibia and I will leave this for four weeks. Generally I use a smooth Steinman pin that's fairly stout for this. Alternatively I'll use a primary arthrodesis if the subtalar joint is significant or 
there is osteochondral damage. My post-surgical regimen starts PT for the ankle and subtalar joint as soon as the incisions have healed. And generally this occurs around two weeks. I will allow weight bearing at eight weeks post-surgery in the presence of a Hawkins sign. Partial collapse of the dome may occur if weight bearing commences at eight weeks without a Hawkins sign. But again, good function is possible despite partial collapse of the Taylor dome, although this is not a situation that I aim for. Now I want to give you a few pearls for fixation of these difficult injuries. The first is the use of a transfiction pin. And as you can see from the image here, I've placed a transverse smooth wire through the head neck region of the talus. And you can see it's entering one side and exiting through the opposite incision. And this is placed medial to lateral. A fairly stout wire of at least two millimeter diameter is used. And this allows you to control the axial rotation of the distal fragment, as well as to provide traction and other manipulation of the distal fragment while you're operating. It really helps in allowing for quick reduction before you place your provisional fixation in the form of K wires that will transfix the fracture site. With comminuted fractures with bone loss, you will likely require multiple reduction attempts, and this allows you to do this. Here you see the same patient with the medial view in the upper left-hand corner, and the lateral view. You can see that this fracture line did enter some of the articular cartilage of the dome, but Using this transfiction pin, I was able to dial in the reduction and then place two wires for provisional fixation. In this video here, you can see me using this joystick or transfiction pin to both provide traction and rotational control of the fracture. It's a fairly simple technique and I would highly recommend you using it. The second pearl is the use of osteotomies for improved visualization and access. I'll show you two here, the first being the cut and crack medial malleolar osteotomy and the second being a tib-fib osteotomy. The medial malleolar cut and crack osteotomy gives you unparalleled access and visualization of fractures that extend posteriorly into the Taylor body and dome. The cut and crack osteotomy is pictured here and involves a cut to the level of the physeal scar followed by placement of a Lambot osteotome, straight osteotome that is, into the osteotomy site and then levering to create a vertical crack down into the joint. Here you see the results of this osteotomy and the unparalleled access that you get with it. The osteotomy site is clearly seen as smooth cancellous bone and it terminates at the physeal scar where the crack portion of the osteotomy then commences. Again, great visualization of both the Taylor neck and the body and dome are able to be obtained with this technique. Pre-drilling of the bone before creation of the osteotomy allows placement of these lag screws and the position screw to hold the plafond in perfectly reduced position while it heals. This intraoperative photo shows the placement of the screw alignment that I use and on the right hand panel you can see approximately 12 weeks postoperatively, how well that osteotomy site has filled in and the 
near perfect congruence of the ankle joint. The second osteotomy I want to speak about is the tib-fib osteotomy. And this is created by using perforations through the tibia and fibula that can be generated with a small 2.0 millimeter drill. Once these drill holes are made, the osteotomy can then be cracked open both through the lateral plafond and the distal diaphysis of the fibula. This osteotomy is very nice in that it maintains the integrity of the syndesmosis and therefore reduces the amount of healing time compared with an osteotomy that would be done just with the fibula alone. It also provides excellent visualization of the lateral Taylor dome. In here I use both lag screws and a fibular plate for fixation once the work has been done and the osteotomy has been reduced. The last pearl that I want to speak to you about today is consider fixing non-displaced Taylor neck fractures. Although these do heal well without fixation, the fixation of non-displaced or minimally displaced Taylor neck fractures allows early mobilization with good pain control in patients. I typically use a posterior ankle arthroscopic assisted lag screw insertion and it allows earlier and less painful ankle and subtalar range of motion as I mentioned earlier. In conclusion, Taylor neck fractures are bad injuries, but 64% of patients overall report good outcomes with proper treatment of these injuries. About 50% of patients will develop ankle or subtalar post-traumatic arthritis. You can help by ensuring that proper reductions are obtained and maintained in your patients. Thanks very much for your time.